Welcome back to the Too Dumb to Quit podcast with Jeremy McCall. Very talented, god awful ugly. <laughs> Happy Wednesday, friends and neighbors. Welcome to the Too Dumb to Quit podcast. It's your old pal, Jeremy. I'm a day late, a dollar short per usual. Yesterday uh, is the day my podcast normally comes out, but we were in the studio cutting the uh, last batch of songs for the new record, which we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up, and we've got a lot on our plate right now. Um, And I don't know if you guys have seen it yet, but we've got a new little series we're doing on YouTube called The Work which uh, is just kind of showing this whole process of what's going on right now and uh, the excitement going on uh, kind of behind the scenes with the new music. So uh, apologies for, uh, for being a day late. But I uh, wanted to make sure we got the podcast rolling, and I just got fortunate enough that one of my dear, dear friends is in town and uh, came into the studio yesterday. I've known this dude, I guess, 17, about 17 years, 2003, it's crazy, uh, 2020, it's uh, 2003, 17 years ago. We're getting old, bud. We're getting old. Fuck. It's my buddy Bones. His real name's Talmadge, but uh, everybody on the road knows him as Bones. What's up, buddy? Man, I tell you, happy Wednesday, and sitting here in Nashville, Tennessee, on this beautiful bus, cannot ask for a blessed day. You and can't. thank you, brother. I'm glad I got to come in the studio with you yesterday, and... Yeah. Being able to hang out here on this nice bus and the podcast with you, Jeremy. <laughs> you can probably hear Bones is a little bit of a character. Uh, everybody on the road knows Bones. Every It doesn't matter what tour, Brooks and Dunn to Montgomery Gentry to Larry the Cable Guy, which is where I met him. Uh, and he, Bones has worked in NASCAR for, when did you start NASCAR? 1991. 91. 91. I was 10. I <laughs> done a little stint till 98 mm-hmm. and uh, went out on the road with the raging Cajun Sammy Kershaw. Yeah. And then went back into racing and finally got out. I was working with Dale Jr. and finally got out two years ago and uh, back out on the road with Sammy Kershaw. With Kershaw again. Yeah. Which is awesome. It's been you a were blast. just talking to him on the phone, man. It's, all, it's crazy to hear that guy's voice. He's still great. He's a he's a blast, man. I tell you, yeah. it's been a lot of fun. We've been doing a uh, tour called the Roots and Boots Tour with Sammy Kershaw, Aaron Tippin, and Colin Ray. And I tell you, man, it's been a blast. I think one of the most, I don't know if it's underrated, but I think people just forget about the song. Me and Justin blasted on the butt, fucking grown-ass men crying on here. But um, Matches oh, that's Sammy awesome. Kershaw. Yeah. If y'all have never heard Matches, you the minute you get off this podcast, you have to go listen to it because it, it, it's one of the greatest songs. Did Skip Ewing write that? Do you know who wrote that? I'm not sure who wrote that. Let's but he, see. Who, he does a phenomenal job at it. And I tell you, he just cut a, a new song um, here recently. It's called My Friend Fred. It's been released. If you want to check that out, that'd be awesome. It's My Friend Fred. Yes. What's it about? Uh it's about drug addictions. Um, back in the, when Sammy was young, he was an alcoholic, drug addict before he was 14, 15 years old. Holy shit. Yeah. Drug he, addict like marijuana or? Like- uh, I'm sure he'd done a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he's been sober for over 30 years. And wow. Uh, this song, he, I'm not really sure who wrote it, but. Um, Whenever he was able to record it, it meant it touched home to him. And just watching the audience, whenever he plays it on stage, it just you see the people that cry. And because everybody in this world knows somebody that has had a drug addiction, yeah. And it hits home to a lot of people, and it means a lot to Sammy to be able to sing it. You know, it's amazing because it's such a different landscape now, especially when it comes to country music. It used to be. You had songwriters, and then you had performers. And these songwriters would write these amazing songs, like Matches was written by Skip Ewing and Roger Springer. And then you would find a guy, Sammy Kershaw, the song would find Kershaw, or Kershaw would find the song, and relate with it so deeply that they would record it in a way that touched people so deeply, where there was this... And now it's, it's different, where every artist wants to be 
in the room to be the songwriter with the other songwriter. And I think in some instances, that's fucking awesome. I mean, I love when people write their own shit, but then there's a difference too. Like Todd Snyder, or you go see, you know, Dean Dillon. It doesn't take away from the guys like Sammy Kershaw or like, and I don't know how much Kershaw writes, but like Kershaw or like Diffie. I don't know how much shit Diffie wrote on all that. I, I doubt he wrote those hits. And then like George Strait. All those fucking George Strait songs were written by Dean Dillon, you know? And so a lot of people don't know that, but it doesn't, I think people get so hung up where it's like, oh, these people don't even write their own shit, you know? And you're like, well, yeah, but there's a difference. Like you have singer songwriters, which is what everybody's trying to lump into these days, right? Right. And there's some guys that don't belong in the writing room. They're just there because they, the other writers need them to be there to get the song fucking on the album. Right. But you've got guys like interpreters, people that, that have a way of connecting with a song and then delivering it in a way that it touches people's souls. And Sammy Kershaw, Joe Diffie, um, you know, Tracy Lawrence, all those badass 90s dudes that everybody talks about now, George Strait, that's what they did. They were these amazing interpreters of incredible music. And, uh, and I've, been, I've been a Kershaw fan forever, man. He was just so good. Yeah, yeah, he's a great he's person. So man. good, and you reflect back that is like a NASCAR. You know, you have a you have a race car driver that does not work on a car, but he can wheel the shit out of that son of a bitch. Right. You know, can't tell you what's fucking wrong with it. Can't tell you what's wrong with it, but he can drive it. Right. You exactly. Know? That's just that's like a, that's such a great analogy. You got a wheel man, and then you got a crew chief, and then you got a fucking mechanic. Right. right? So, let's go back to ninety one. Uh, when you started in NASCAR, because you're from Charlotte, or well, you're from Alabama. Alabama, but. yeah, and that's where I got started with Davey Allison in 1991. Um, I worked around in the shop for probably two or three months for free, and uh, Davey called me up in the office, which I thought he was getting ready to run me out of the shop because of insurance, <laughs> and he asked me if I wanted to do this for a living, and I said, hell yeah. So oh, yeah. I <laughs> started out making $250 a week, and... Wow. Uh, you know, I just thank God for the opportunity I had in racing, won a lot of championships, a lot of races, and now I make 275 a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so when you start in a in Davy Allison's shop, like, what are you doing? What's your, what's well, your job at that back point? in the day, I was just learning. I was breaking down tires off the rims, uh, sweeping the floor, and did taking you have out the like, trash. Did and, you have car experience at all at this point? Zero. So you're just starting from scratch. Uh, yes. Guys was, are showing you how to put fucking lug nuts on. I was strictly, I was graduated in 89, and I took a year off of doing nothing but drinking and yeah. partying, and then I had the opportunity. I set two goals in my life. One was racing, and the other one was country music. And, you know, like a, if I died right now, I wouldn't care because I've, I've lived a good life, and I've met some damn good people. Yeah. So you work, you're sweeping the floor in Davy Allison's shop in Alabama? Yep. Was there a lot of NASCAR guys out of Alabama at that no. point? No. Uh, not at all. Um, he got killed in 1993 in a helicopter crash in Talladega. Yeah. We kept the shop open until 95 with uh, different drivers, and then uh, shut the shop down, and I had a choice of going and digging ditches or figuring out another life. And I moved to North Carolina in 1995 and went to work at Mahari Racing. And I worked at Hendrick for 11 years. And then Turner Motorsports with James Boucher, won a championship in 2012 with James. And um, that, Is that two, that couldn't have been 2012. 2012 is when we won the championship, yeah. No uh, fucking way. Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's been a while, bud. That's eight years ago. Yeah, man. Whoa. How time flies. Damn. Yes. So, and when I met you, you were at Hendrick. Yes. Um, what were you doing at Hendrick at that time? Because you've held a lot working, of jobs throughout these organizations. I was organizations. working with the truck team with Jack Sprague, and um, that was my first gig there. And uh, went with Ricky Hendrick whenever he started driving, and then he got hurt and so he quit driving and he was just kind of running the team and uh and i worked with kyle bush yeah worked with jimmy johnson you know hendrick was a great place to work and then after our plane crash it took some lives of changes some stuff yeah, yeah so i just 
decided to move on from there, and that's when I went to work with uh, Turner Motorsports, whenever uh, Mr. Turner started that uh, race team up with James. And um, yeah. for five years there, and I'll tell you what, that was probably the best five years of racing I ever had. It really? Was a lot of fun, close family, and that was good. Mr. Turner, Steve, uh, I mean, you introduced me to Steve. Correct. Uh, I get this phone call from Bones. Bones is notorious for these crazy phone calls. Bones will call you in the middle of the night and just go, hey, uh, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> so I get one of these calls, it's a, and I remember it. It's a two, it was a, I think it was a Monday, because you called me, and you were like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm sitting at home, and you were like, I need you to come play Wagon Wheel at this benefit in Houston. And I'm like, oh, okay, when? You had to go so, on the red carpet tomorrow, the next day, right? Yeah, yeah, and I had to do the red carpet with Courtney for the CMT Awards. I'm like, dude, I can't make it to Houston and then get back to Nashville in time to walk my wife down the red carpet. And my wife will kill me. I can't do it. And he's Bones goes, hey, hold on a second. And I hear him in the background. Hey, uh, come back on. All right, my, my team owner is going to send a private jet out to get you. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> so we flew down to Houston. And that was my first introduction into the kind of the Turner Motorsports family. And, uh, and then a sense of, you know, I know uh, your relationship with the whole family down there is still very strong, you know, with James and Chris and, oh, yeah. and Stuart and, and all of them. And, uh, and you know. Well, your, your relationship's grown with them, too. Oh, and, yeah, you know, yeah. And Steve Turner was a huge part of us kind of getting up and running, too, in our own way. And. And helped us immensely, immensely, and, and I'm always in, in debt to him for that. And um, so, explain as you're going through, like for somebody who doesn't know shit about racing, like people always go, like, "Man, are you a big race fan?" And Justin, my driver, you know, he, he's a huge fucking race fan. I, 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 people always go, "Are you a big race fan?" And I go, "It depends on who my buddy Bones is working for, because that's the hat I'm wearing, it's the coat I'm wearing." <laughs> It's the fucking bag I'm w carrying through the airport. Bones has always been like, hey, take this shit. I can't use it anymore. I'm on a different team or whatever. So when you were like, um, what, was the, what was the job you enjoyed most in like NASCAR or truck series or whatever it was? Well, like, was there a certain job you liked better than others like out of all the shit you've done? Because you've really done a lot of different jobs throughout the racing yeah, mostly it was, you know, driving the hauler and, um, you know, just taking care of the team members and pit crew for years and uh, just the camaraderie, camaraderie of meeting people and just enjoying life. You know, it's, I don't really have a, a really word to say of which one I enjoyed the most, but I have worked with some assholes. Yeah. You know, for sure. What's your day? All right, so... You're working with Dale Jr. What's your day look like from, like, when does it start? Walk me through, like, what a day looks like from the time you pull into the fucking the track. Well, we normally would, it all depends on where we was racing at, you know, and what. Because NASCAR day, fans are, are crazy about it. Like, you guys do the fucking parade. I'd never seen oh, yeah. that shit until I was at your house that time. We got stuck in traffic, and you're like, oh, they're doing the fucking holler parade yeah, or whatever. Yeah, parades and... Uh, for those of you that don't know, a holler parade is, as all the trucks are coming in, carrying the cars and the crews and shit, these people fucking line the roads to watch yep. you guys pull into these. They love seeing the big shiny rigs. Oh, you know? man, it's crazy. <laughs> so walk us through a, what a day looks but like. It all depends on where we'd go to race. You know, normally we'd leave, uh, like on a Wednesday, be at the track, you know, drive to the track, and then uh, the crew guys would show up, and we'd unload and practice on... Thursday, Friday, normal race on Saturday. and Do you get to practice on the track yeah. that you're racing that weekend? Yeah. So, like, if you're at Daytona, you're... Practice and then qualify and then race. And then after the race, you'd load up and haul ass back home and unload everything and get everything cleaned up and... Rebuild fucking um, engines and cars. And yeah, the, the there's shop guys that stay back at the house and at the shop and get everything ready for the next week. And then, you know, you have seven or eight, you know, different cars 
and then you unload, you know, for a super speedway, if you're going to a short track, and then you unload the super speedway cars and then load the short track cars up and do it all over again. It's just And there's a lot of drivers who, like, they'll drive, and I'm really naive to race. All I know about racing is what I know from you. But, like, there's guys, like, these huge NASCAR stars that will drive Sunday, or you know, and then they'll go do a fucking dirt track. Yeah. Like two days later with a bunch of guys that nobody you've never fucking heard of. Yeah, because it's they go back to the roots, yeah, you know, where they came from. Just and in their blood. That's awesome that they do that, you know, they made the big time, but they still go to the local tracks where they yeah. ran and, you know. That's crazy. I mean, it would be like George Strait playing like Houston Stadium. And then going down and playing at fucking do si Do's afterwards. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. oh, I'm going to go down and play do si Do's on Monday. You yeah. Know? Like, damn, George. Yeah, exactly. You know, NASCAR, it, it started going downhill a little bit. The fans, you know, got to where they were not coming as much. But I, I see it picking back up. You know, it Daytona like this it. past weekend, you know. Dude, that wreck. Our awesome President Trump was there to do the Dude, Grand Marshal and crazy. took a lap. Took a lap the in the uh, in couldn't the ask for any Cadillac. better. Like, sold out Daytona, but you know it got rained out, and they had to run it Monday. And then um, coming to the checker flag, you know that it was a bad wreck. Ryan Newman, and Ryan Newman, man, that thing was nasty. Thank God, there's a lot of prayers um, sent out to him, and thank God he's awake and talking now. But we thought we lost him, dude. I and again, I'm not a huge race fan, but I saw that wreck. And, you know, these cars are built so incredibly. Um, but the car, you know, gets spun out, hits the wall. You're already hitting a wall at 200 miles an hour, which is just madness. And then he flips over. If you haven't seen the video, he flips over. And after he flips over, he's on his lid. And the car spins to where the car behind him hits his door where he's sitting. Instead of, like, hitting the back of the car or the front of the car or whatever. Hits the fucking door he's sitting at, and it looked bad. Yeah, hit him right in the uh, driver's door to win the net. Yeah. And uh, matter of fact, I had That's just, like worst case scenario. I just received a text saying Ryan Newman just walked out of the hospital, mm. and here's a picture with him and his two girls walking uh, out of the hospital. Oh, uh, look at that. He was wow. bleeding. Um, he had uh, bleeding in the front of his head and stuff, but... I mean, he's a big old boy. He's yeah. like a damn linebacker. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that's why it took him so long to get out of the car. Yeah. One, but, and that son bitch upside down on fire. <laughs> not, good. Good. not good. Not good. Not <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, and you guys are a huge family. You know all these dudes. Yeah. Um, it's amazing to go to a race with Bones. I, uh, We were in a sprinter at the time, and we went to, I don't remember, we were like passing by like Kansas Motor Speedway or something. Yeah. And I called Bones. I'm like, man, we're going by right now. Are you there? And he's like, I'm pull in, pull in, some bitch. So we pull in and we go walking around the pits and we come out. And I just got in the sprinter and it was like our baby and it was all shiny. And there's a guy with like a uh, leaning against it. He's got like rhinestones on the, on the fucking, on the top of his jacket. And he's like leaning against it. And I go, Damn, who is leaning against this sprinter right now? And uh, Bones goes over and goes, Richard. <laughs> it was Richard Petty. My band flipped out. They flipped <laughs> out. And everybody knows Bones. But, um, but you know, the way I look at it, these people get up every day and put their pants on just like we do. Yeah. You know, they're no better. No. They just got a shitload more money than I do. Yeah, well, <laughs> and they're doing 200 miles an hour everywhere they go. Yeah, they got bigger balls. Dude. Mm. That's terrifying. Crazy. So you uh, you do the NASCAR thing. So you go 91 to 98. You go out with Sammy Kershaw. And then you and Sammy began kind of your unbreakable bond there. You guys are tied at the hip forever. Yeah. Um, and then at what point did you just go, man, you know, what what was it like for you where you were like, nah, I just don't. I just, I just don't want to do racing anymore. I want to go back there. Was it Sammy calling you? And because Sammy, well, when I left Sammy, and my son was born, and you know, back in the nineties, Sammy was banging it out big time. You know, we were yeah. doing constantly, Too and um, I want to spend a little bit more time with my son. And 
but me and Sammy had always stayed close and um, just by the grace of God, whenever I decided to get out, I was sitting out on my deck having a, a Corona, not the, <laughs> not the virus. But, uh, um, just so happened he called and asked what I was doing and asked me what I'd like to come back to work. And I said, hell yeah. And uh, it, uh, God has a reason for everything. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a blessing that um, I'm able to work with him and do something I love, you know? It's, yeah. Well, and it's, it's great when you can be out with your friends doing it, you know? Um, and it's crazy because it's like people who don't travel this way, it's hard to comprehend when you, you're putting like your family, your band, your life, everybody's life who works for you in the hands of somebody, you know, it's a, it takes a lot of trust and it takes a, it takes a long time to get that. And, um, for Sammy to have you out, which obviously, you know, um, he trusts you implicitly, and you guys are so tight. But, I mean, hell. Well, it's just like you and Justin, you know. You can go yeah. back here and go to sleep, and you know Justin's going to take care of you. Exactly, you know? exactly. And the other great thing about it is, too, is it's like there, there was a, a night where Justin couldn't, I don't know, Justin was gone or couldn't, maybe he had a family emergency, and you came out and got Courtney back in time. She had to go down to an audition. Yeah, we flew, you flew me to uh, Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska. Yep. Yeah, yep. and Bones got us home, and it's, um, it's amazing to have guys like you. You know, I, I've got two of them. I, I don't trust anybody else. You know, you, Justin and you, and and um, this is an incredible thing. So you're back on the Roots and Boots tour, doing that. You guys are staying busy too. Yeah, man. We're, Shit, y'all are rolling, banging it out. This week we go to um, well Monday we done a show at the Nashville Palace. Sammy, Aaron, Colin, and. Miss Pam Tillis. Pam Tillis. Wow, we boy, that was yeah, that was good times. Right That's there. country royalty, man. My God, that was amazing. Then we go Cedartown, Georgia, Friday night, and Dothan, Alabama, on Saturday, and then head back, back home. home. Yep. Has because uh, your pals with Ira Dean. Yeah. Ira lives. Ira fucking Dean. Ira fucking Dean. <laughs> Everybody says it the same way. Uh, everybody loves Ira, but Ira lives. I don't know if he still lives, but he lived next door to Mel Tillis. He lives close to Mel. Yes, I think he still does. And I remember Ira telling the story where he goes, uh, he went over to, to Mel's studio. And Mel, Mel's name is on everything. It's on the chairs. You know, it's on, it's on the couch. It's on the wall. You know, it's Mel Tillis Bill, you know. And, uh, and Ira said, he goes, man, Mel, you got your name on everything in here. You know, and Mel's got a little bit of that stutter. Yeah, when I, was, I was wondering if he had so many M's in there. Yeah, um, right. um, 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 um. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Mel stutters, and then when he sings, he doesn't stutter. It's amazing, crazy. you know. It's crazy. That. Yeah. And uh, and Iris said, Mel said, well, when you're a country music royalty, you can put your name on whatever you want too. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious, Mel Tillis. Mm. But uh, man, it's so awesome. What? Um, so you you do the NASCAR thing? Where? What's your favorite track? Uh. I love super speedway racing Daytona and Talladega. What's the difference in like super speedway to? Well, you, your super speedways are you know Daytona's two mile track, Talladega's two and a half mile. Okay, you know, so you're going faster. Yes, yeah, so you're going over two hundred, and it's all in the aerodynamics of the car and the driver. I mean, a, a pit crew guy or a, a crew guy that builds a car or whatever, you can only do so much at a track like that. Springs. I mean, back in the day, we used to, you know, carry three or four motors and change motors, you know, after practice, you know, put one in for qualifying, pull it out, put one in for the race. Damn. And all them days are done. You know, it, you run, basically run what you brung and hope you brung enough kind of thing. NASCAR really? regulated a lot of that stuff. Yeah. But it, the speedway races, you know, it's all in the drafting, you know, a yeah. guy that is a rookie that qualified 38th per se, he could still win that race. Yeah. You know, it's all in the drafting because, you know, somebody's going to wad something up yeah, and flip and whatever. So, I mean, I've seen guys that, you know, that's win a race and that's probably the only race they'll ever win, you know, super speedway, just by luck. But, it's crazy. Yep. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just, I mean, there's, in, but it does stick out the good drivers. You can oh, see. yeah. yeah. 
the guys who really know their shit. Yeah. You know, in the well, back field. in the day, they've always said that Dale Earnhardt Sr. could see air. Hmm. It was crazy. And he can, the way the air flew was airflow inside the car, he could feel it come across his helmet back in the day when he had open face helmets. He could tell if a car was beside him, where he was at, wow. without even looking in his mirror. Weird. That man was something else, boy. Yeah. Crazy. That's crazy. Did you spend any time around him? Yes, I did. Really? Yeah. What yeah. was he like to be around? Was it a bigger than life persona? It was like you walking up talking to Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was. I mean, you're just like this is the fucking man. That's the man. You know, he was a jokester. He'd grab you by the neck and you know, yeah, bullshit with you. But it was, it was star. You know, really starstruck when you talked to him. You didn't know whether to be yeah. nervous and yeah. shit your pants or what. <laughs> yeah. What happened. Fucking Dale Earnhardt. But, I mean, he was great. Great guy. Super. I uh, My favorite thing I've ever seen um, when it comes to, to Earnhardt was, there's a video, I'm sure you've seen it, um, where I think Dale Jr. had just won a race, and he was racing for his dad, you know. And the reporter said, Dale, are, are you the... Are you the car owner right now, or, or are you just a proud? Or is, he said, "Is this your your race car driver, or is this your son?" And they asked Dale Jr. first. They said, "Is is this your dad, or is this your car owner?" And he goes, "It's my car owner." That's right. And he said, "Dale, is this your race car driver? Or is that your son?" And he goes, "This is my son." That's right. And I just I get tears in my eyes. I don't even, you know. That's just that. Uh, yeah, he was hard on Dale Jr., you know, but, you know, yeah. he, he made him a good driver. And, yeah. But, you know, the last lap Oof. of the Daytona 500, you know, whenever he got killed. And he was blocking for Jr., right? He was running third watching Michael Waltrip and uh, Dale Jr., you know, getting ready to finish one, two. And uh, that was his two cars he owned. And he was. You know, trying to hold the rest of the pack off and then just got tangled up and yeah. that's what took his life. But yeah, it was a sad day in NASCAR. The um there's a song that uh, Eddie Kay from the band Ricochet wrote. They were playing the club that I own now, um, uh, but back in the day it was called Kelly's. And Ricochet, this was like maybe three or four Four days after the accident, um, Ricochet was playing at the club. And Eddie Kay, who's now in the Montgomery Gentry Band, he's been there for shit. There's no telling him 15 years, maybe 12 years. I don't even know. Um, but Eddie Kay was, I was in radio at the time too. So Eddie Kay goes, man, I, I, I want to play the song we just wrote. And um, I don't know. Have you ever heard it? It's called It's Sunday Soon. I don't think I have. Oh, man. It's like, it's. It's the whole day. It's, wow. And it's about that, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, it's Sunday soon. Um, oh, shit. I used to I used to just play it on the bus, but it's Sunday soon. You're, uh, the race will run. I, I, I've got to rest. you got to run. And it's like a song from Dale to Dale Jr. And I think the last line going into the last chorus is something like, uh, uh, on my last turn, next thing I know, you know, I whispered, go, son, go. And it's just, the fucking thing just burns your life down wow, when you I'll listen to it. check that out. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they ever put it out, but I'll email them, I'll get you a copy of it, because yeah. it's so damn good. Um, but, yeah, that's... And you still see it, man. Like, um, it's, it's an amazing legacy, because every country show you go to, like, I just... Did a run of uh, shows with Cole Ford. There's Earnhardt shit everywhere. Oh, know, yeah. Dale Sr. shit That everywhere. band's still making money and he's dead. It's crazy. Crazy, yeah. It's insane. And yep. Junior, d- Junior's not racing anymore, is no. he? He's done. Yeah, he had uh, four or five concussions. And yeah. And he couldn't stand another one. Yeah. And he'd been... He'd been... Well, vegetable. how much... Yeah, like how much is enough? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what's worth it? I mean, there's drivers that... I mean, NASCAR has, rec- I mean, mandated more safety each and every year to protect these drivers. But you know what? Whenever 
these guys strap in a car, they know what they're up against. That's yeah. just like a football player, whenever he steps yeah. out on that field, you know, that he knows what he's against. Yeah. You know, whether he'll ever walk off that field again or not. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. That's crazy. What's your best memory from NASCAR? Do you have one that just sticks out? I mean, other than obviously the championships and stuff, but is there like, uh, is there a memory where you're just like, man, that was just, and I know it, it's like somebody asking me like, what's your favorite song? I mean, fuck man. I don't know. I was in it 20, 25 years, but, uh, I would probably have to say the most shocking and the most thrilling. I want to say we was at Kansas or Kentucky. I'd have to ask James, but James we was in the truck series. That was 2012 when we won the championship, but, um, I can't believe it was that long ago. The first start of the race, James come on the radio and he said, something wrong with the the truck. Can't get it up to speed. Come to find out it was a carburetor. So we come down pit road, changed the carburetor, went two laps down, and that little son of a bitch made two laps up during the race. We won the race. Whoa. We won the championship that year. Yeah. I remember that. That year was, that was magic crazy. for you guys. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I keep saying about James, but I tell you, that was, like I said, that was the most fun I've ever had in racing. Yeah. And, you know, he's doing real estate now, him and his wife, and yeah. they're doing good, but. They're doing amazing stuff for oh, um, adoption. Yes. To, like, for families. It's called the Boucher Foundation. Yep. And uh, anybody that wants to check it out, um, it really is an amazing thing. I played their foundation party the last two years, and I'm playing it again this year. Um, they raise a ton of money, and I think this year—I mean, I think this year they raised over a hundred grand wow. one night. Um, where what they do is adoption is so expensive now um, for families that really want to make the difference in the life of a child. Maybe they don't have the thirty or forty thousand dollars it takes to go get all this paperwork and all the shit done, all the background stuff. And so they're actually vetting like great deserving families who really, really want to adopt and they're paying all the fees. Yeah. It's amazing that they're able to do that and the money that they have raised. And it's, you know, it's, I'm sure it's an honor to you to have them invite you to come out and do that. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, that just shows the relationship you have with them, and well, they're such good people. I mean, they're yeah. really good people, and they're doing amazing. I and mean, they they've got they adopted their son, correct? Um, yeah, because Chris, she couldn't have a baby, and then they adopted Stetson. Yeah, they adopted, and then they had, then um, she turned around and had um, their daughter. Had the daughter, yeah. Yeah. So, and um, that's an amazing thing. But they're doing an incredible, incredible work for uh, families looking to adopt. And you you come from that background, too. Yes, I was adopted whenever I was five months. Yeah, five months old. Uh, Tried to return you, but yeah, they, <laughs> there was a there was they, a no refund policy yeah. after 30 I days. I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and I got adopted at five months old. And um, I've never met my my mother or my father that yeah but they had me in a uh i guess it was back in the day it was probably like a fucking pet smart you know you just walk up to the window and not want this little kid you know so uh, uh i'll take the skinny one in the yeah window. let me have that little skinny baby right there <laughs> <laughs> what how do you think that that uh how do you think that that upbringing because you and your adopted mom were thick as thieves man you're as tight as two people could be yep and, and God I, rest her soul. Yeah, she passed away um, a little over a year ago, but and that goes back to saying God has a reason for everything. And I, I was blessed to be adopted by the lady because I, you know, I don't know where I'd be right now. Yeah, if I wasn't. But the lady that had me, um, I respect her for putting me up for adoption instead of throwing me in a dumpster somewhere. Yeah. You know? So, but me and my wife Betsy, we. Um, Betsy researched, and we found my mother's name, but that's as far as we've went. As far we've as not, we went. Yeah, we haven't really um, 
investigate any more of really trying to hunt her down or anything. She would only be, she was 15 years old when she had me. So, wow. Yeah. I know how that so goes. So she couldn't, she couldn't raise me. I know how that shit goes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 22 year old. Yeah, but enough of that sorry, sad shit. But how do you think? How do you think though that it shaped you as a human? I think, into that, I think that's I think it was important... great because I was, I was raised up in a, a good home. Yeah, you know, and it was because you're a great man. You're a great person. It was it was a great up upbringing. I mean, I got my ass tore up when I needed it, but yeah, you know, it was, you should still use it. Probably. Yeah, my wife does that though. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah! Well, that's a it's an amazing. It really is an amazing story, and to watch your career through NASCAR and then back to country music and what. Uh... Well, speaking of careers, I'm. I want to reiterate on this: is um, I'm happy for what you've done, watching your career oh. from when you was a tour manager with Larry Larry Cable Guy, and then uh, watching you come up to what you've done today. And man, you're touring your ass off. Buddy. Yeah, we're trying, man. A lot of people Thank proud you, of man. you. Thank you, buddy. It's it's been a crazy it's been a crazy thing, you know. I think I think that's what I like so much about the philosophy stuff now, and the reason I get so into it. I'm sure people get tired of me constantly talking about stoicism or jujitsu or whatever, but it's all like it's all become part of the process for me of like um, perseverance and staying through it and. Um, the only reason, like, uh, it's like Ron White told me forever ago, that's why I call the podcast this, you know, it's just too dumb to quit. And it was like, there are a lot of times I probably should have just hung this shit up and just went back to Idaho and just quit. But uh, not quitting, persevering, staying in town, and, uh, and allowing the growth and the experience and the touring and the struggle. And, you know, I used to think the struggle was the worst part. And then you look back... You start to realize, you go, when everybody talks about the good old days, and they're like, man, remember back when? It's never the easy times people talk about. When they're like, man, when you and me were doing this, we were so fucking broke, we were eating ramen and sleeping on the floor. The good old days are the struggle. It's always the struggle. Right. And um, I think if you can find a way to live in that a little bit and like enjoy it, um, the struggle is fucking awesome. The struggle is amazing. And to be able to take it in and to get a second chance at it. And I almost feel like, you know, uh, so many people I know, you know, when you look at opportunities, you're like, man, if I knew then what I know now, it would be totally different. And I feel like I'm getting that. I feel like I'm getting But you've always had that never give up attitude. Yeah. You know, just yeah. like that, what was the little cartoon thing with the stork and you had him by the neck and said, never give up? Yeah. You know, that's you. you yeah. Know, you never give up. Eating, well, a, you don't eating a thing of Roman noodles and... Having ten dollars in your pocket, but you're still out there singing, and you're yeah. So you you've never given up, and that's Too that's what makes you the damn person you are. Yeah, well, thank you, bro. I freaking love you. I'm glad you did the podcast today, man. man. This is fun. I've never done this. Well, I've done it one time with uh, Jeff Reed. Oh, Jeff Reed. Oh, NFL that's another guy. I've met player. the weirdest people through you, <laughs> like Jeff Reed from uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, two times Super Bowl. Champ, uh, who I've been around a bunch of times now. That's a crazy he, son. Bitch. He is a crazy son, bitch. <laughs> he is wild. Mm. He's wild enough to shoot at. He's toned it down a little bit. It seems. Yeah, like. he has. Yeah. Staying off the brown liquor helps. Uh, maybe. Yeah, for sure. The moonshine. Mm. Mm. Damn it, boy. Oh lord. <laughs> That's a ticking time bomb. Oh man, Jeff Reed. And then we do this thing every year. Um, we have a bunch of like, it's funny because we all become a family. Um, we do this thing every year out in, uh, the Carolinas called Mudbugs for Maddie, which happens every May. This is the first year I'm going to miss it. Man, I know that sucks. You got so a lot bummed, of people man. upset about that. I mean, not, I mean, they're sad. I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm sad, man. I'm going to be in Europe. Uh, but they do this thing for, for the Rucker family. It's called Mudbugs for Maddie. I think it's May May sixteenth. May sixteenth this year. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, if you're anywhere in the southeast, you should go. I think is Colin Ray doing it this year? Yeah. Whenever uh, you wasn't going to make it, um, I got in touch with Colin Ray, and uh, we're going to fly him in, and he's going to come in and 
Colin uh, Ray, CJ Solar, uh, Huck, 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 Rick Huckabee, yeah. um, Mark Starnes, Mark Starnes and the Boys. Yeah, and uh, it's just a great group of people, and that thing has fucking grown like crazy. When we first started, I like Woodstock. Yeah, I've been there every year. So what you do is everybody's parking out on this farm, and you camp, and then you do two days of music. You have a Friday, Saturday, um, and it's all raising money to put um, the friends of, uh, of of Maddie Rucker. Uh, the foundation's called What Would Maddie Do? And um, it's uh, for the Rucker family in the memory of their daughter, uh, Maddie, who had passed away uh, in a tragic accident. But... They they're putting her friends through college. They're doing all these ama- this amazing stuff with the with the money that they're raising, and every year it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Now there's it used to be a bunch of rednecks and fucking tents in a field, and now there's like two we buses. Bringing, just prevost. And- oh my god, <laughs> Dude, there's fifth wheels and there's like little towns. It's like it's like Marshalltown sets up like a week before. There's people out there a week before the event, yeah, camping out all week. And so March 16th, look, uh, look it up online if you're anywhere in the southeast or you're thinking about going uh, Mudbugs for Maddie in May. And uh, you will not be sad that you went. They yeah, do the a May 15th boil. or 16th, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. yeah. They do a, a crawfish boil for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. They do uh, this really amazing Chinese lantern uh, thing and, uh, and then an epic bonfire. It, it's like somebody burns down the trailer park out there i mean mm. it's a damn uh a damn killer whale couldn't jump <laughs> over this thing it's crazy uh so mud bugs for maddie's happening and uh and lots of stuff going on so make sure you're checking out the uh sammy Kerr. is it sammy is that what it is do you know yeah sammy com on the tour dates and the roots and boots tour with uh, aaron tippin and colin ray which damn that's what a great show we're hoping that maybe we can get you out there to open up for us. Oh, hell yeah. Time. Yeah, man, that would be really killer. Dude, I would love it. We're going to make it. that happen. Love it so much. Dude, thank you for taking the time today, man. Man, I sure appreciate you inviting me, and I love the Great. candles you got going on in yeah, here. Yeah, man, look at this. Yeah. It's very romantic. I, I love for, it. For, I, I can't wait you put your clothes back on. But. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but, but my inline skates don't fit over the bottoms of my jeans. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Well, friends and neighbors, remember to be nice to each other out there. Uh, Big thanks to my buddy Bones, and make sure you go see him on the road with Sammy Kershaw this year. Plus, he's wearing his cowboy hat again, and you look dapper, friend. You're looking good in it. I saw that picture of you and Pam Tillis. Yeah, uh, Sammy calls me Tal McGraw. (laughs) Tal McGraw. (laughs) I love it. Well, friends and neighbors, this is the Too Dumb to Quit podcast. We'll be talking to you next week. Thanks for hanging out. Make sure you tell your friends and uh, to jump on here and check it out. And this week, uh, catch me on the road. I'm going to be in Riverton, Illinois at the Backroom Lounge on Friday and Saturday night. I'll be in Huntington, West Virginia. I think that show's almost sold out. I've got my buddy Gary Quinn from the UK going to come and open a couple of these shows along with Joe Lambiot in Huntington. So it'll be a Huntington drunk night. Get your uh, get get uh, DD Mike on the line and see if he can get you a ride back home. So it's gonna be a good one. Okay, though. But before we go, Bones, you're famous for something. Uh, after a couple of wobbly pops, you've been known to get on stage and you do this train whistle with just your mouth. There's there's no like whistle. There's no apparatus whatsoever. So could you end the podcast today with your patented uh, with your patented train whistle? <laughs> Toot toot, bitches. (laughs) 